Uhu, hallo, testing, testing, hallo, sound, sound test, sound test. Uhuhu. Oh wait, is the loud? Is the is the sound too loud? Am I? Wait, 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 wait. I think I need to change this. Mm. Here, hello, hello. Yes, it's this is a little too loud. I think. Uh -huh. Hello, hello. Yes. Alrighty. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Woohoo! It's been a while, huh? Rasto, Victor, hey, how you guys doing? Good to see you here. Hey, Parastorm, what's up, man? Good to see you. Um, so it's, um, I hope, I don't know where you are, <laughs> but I hope it's a better place than Boston. It's snowing quite a lot here today. It's actually super, super snowed out there right now. Uh, I had to brush all the snow out of my car right now. If you follow me on Instagram, I'm going to post this. Um, this video that I made, <laughs> cleaning my, cleaning up my car. Um, hey, hey, dudes, come on. Hey, Monique, what's up? Good to see you. Alrighty. So it's been a while. I know I promised I was gonna, um, um well, so I have one of my, my years, one of my new year's resolution this year is that we're going to record all the way up to live stream 100. Um, so that means that we need so this is number 40, so we have 60 more to go. <laughs> so it's going to be a lot. Uh, and we already run a month. We're already a month later. So, but it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to catch up very soon. Because, uh, I mean, if we record two, two streams every week, that is that boils down to 30 weeks, which I think is pretty doable. Anyway, um, Ahmad Sam, ha, Habugimana, I don't think I've seen you before. Nice to meet you, Anguito. Hi, how are you doing? All right, well, so, um, so yes, as I was saying, I have not been recording a lot this past month because, as many of you know, I teach uh, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and uh, it was just the beginning of the semester, and I had a lot of courses to prepare, a lot of stuff, a lot of lectures, so it's been a little busy. So, but things are... A bit more under control now and so I think I got the semester under control so we're going to try <clears throat> I'm going to try to pick this up again and I have a lot of things that I want to cover so we have the introduction to grasshopper playlist that is only at the beginning so we need to record a lot on that front even though what we're going to do today is that we're going to have a lot of fun with one of my favorite topics which is um, real-time coordination between different processes or different machines. The idea is that um, with the times that we live, it's not enough anymore that we have self-contained software or self-contained program in our machines that we do things with. But it's more and more important increasingly that we start writing, that we start working with data that is coordinated among different devices, among different pieces of software, and even among different places on this round planet that we live in. So the way to do that typically involves uh, network communication, typically involves protocols that makes machines talk to each other. And there are many different ways of doing that. But one of my favorites is this one protocol called WebSockets, which is specifically designed for real-time exchange of information between clients and servers, okay? Um, and it's a little different from the standard protocols, HTTP, the one that we use mostly for um, web pages and that kind of stuff, in that, the, um, in that the connection stays alive and data flows back and forth between clients and server. It's much more for real-time data stuff. Uh, so, for example, if you ever had a... If you've ever gone into a browser or a web page and you've done chatting on a web page, very, very likely you were using WebSockets as the underlying protocol in that. So it's really good for that. And I find it very easy to implement, very playful. And you can do a lot of cool things with that. So um, it also happens that I'm teaching a little bit of that in my, in my main course that I'm teaching in the spring here at Harvard. It's uh, the inactive design course. So I'm going to be needing, I'm basically going to be recording a bunch of tutorials around that topic that I can also use as support material for my class. 
Okay. Uh, I also, I don't know if I ever commented on this, but I'm also doing a guest lectureship, if that's a name, <laughs> this year, this spring at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm teaching a new course. I'm teaching a course for a new master's that they opened their master's. It's a master of science in robotic autonomous systems. It's the first year that it happens. And in the second semester, students have an advanced robotic programming class that I'm co-teaching with Jeffrey Anderson. So um, it's a really interesting class where I'm teaching them advanced topics in robotic programming, in real-time communication with machines, etc., etc. And a little bit of this, some of this content will also be useful for that class, all right? So, um, so basically what we're going to do today, um, it was going to be one stream, but I don't think I'm going to have time to cover everything that I want in with one single stream. So we're going to do a double stream today. Uh, so 10 a.m. now and then 2 p.m. in the afternoon, my time. I live in Boston, so you can do the math, how that, uh, where that finds you right now. And, um, <laughs> and um, so what, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you how to um, the basics of the super, super basics of network communication. And specifically, I'm going to teach you how to create a WebSocket server. Okay, so something that we can put online on the cloud and can receive communication, can receive incoming connections from clients. And then through the course, I'm planning on recording a series. So through the course of this series, I want to be able to show you different examples of how to connect to this WebSocket server with different clients. So for example, uh, with JavaScript, with <coughs> Python, <coughs> I hear in the chat, somebody is mentioning already that, um, with Python, with Grasshopper, with processing, how to communicate with this uh, server and how to make clients, everyone that is connected there, to share information. And it's going to be very cool because with this technique, we will be able to exchange information in real time between different clients that might be connected anywhere in the world. So I'm going to, I'm planning on doing a simple example where we have two clients and I can move a circle from one and then the circle will move in the other. And I want to share a link with all of us so that everyone who's connected to the live stream can actually go to that client and exchange information and you can, we can all see it live together, which is a lot of fun. And then I will explain how to do more advanced topics. Um, so for example, how we can create a drawing app where I can create a, a trace and then that trace shows up on everybody else, on everybody else's computer, or perhaps even, I don't know, I haven't really tried this, but in Grasshopper, if we have a mesh and then I move the mesh and I change it, how can I make that mesh? Um, um, how can I broadcast those changes to anyone that might be listening? I don't even know if I can do that. I haven't really tried yet, but uh, we will be making that happen over the course of, uh, of this series. And I also want to make a tutorial to write a Telegram bot. I don't know if any of you are using Telegram. It's basically, it's basically very similar to WhatsApp, but it's I think it's based in Eastern Europe and they have um, higher data privacy um, policies, etc. It's getting a lot of uh, hype these days. But what I find more interesting is that it allows you to write automated bots that you can chat with and that you can get functionality with. So I hope to write a Telegram bot that we can use also to control a grasshopper definition or some drawing or uh, I don't know, something in Unity, who knows, all right? Because at the end of the day, once we have it under control, the whole WebSocket communication is in data exchange, then we can connect anything with anything. And actually I used, for example, a Telegram bot a while ago to, to turn the lights on and off in my apartment <laughs> from anywhere. So maybe we can do something similar to that, but with an Arduino and then we can turn it off and maybe everyone uh, on the chat can just join that Telegram bot uh, and turn on the lights on my, on my Arduino board, okay? So it's going to take us at least two live streams, if not more, probably to cover. So this is going to become a series. It's going to be a mini series, like fun with WebSockets or something like that. I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll find the name for that. But um, 
Um, and how are we going to start this? So I'm going. Let me check on the chat. Um, hi, Nilen. Thank you for thank you for being here and for following. That's great. Uh, Habugimana, you're you're new. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, Billy's. Oh yes, of course. I need to do this. So we have a Discord. Uh, for those of you who might be new to the channel, we have a Discord where we have offline conversations while we're not streaming. And um, we have channels for C Sharp, Grasshopper, <laughs> Python. <clears throat> Even we have some Python. Yeah, I know. Uh, and uh, where is the link to that? Is it is it on the video description? Can someone tell me if on the video description of the live stream, we have the Discord, an invitation to Discord? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to just post. Um, mm -mm. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to post. All right. Can someone tell me if? No. Okay, we don't have it. All right. So did you see the Discord link that I posted right now on the chat? Because um, I think that YouTube chat doesn't allow to, 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 to do links. So let me can someone tell me if that worked? Okay, follow. All right, I just posted, I just changed the description on this video. Okay. All right, cool. So you saw the Discord channel? All right. Okay, so that's good. So you're welcome to join the Discord where we have um, offline conversations every of between live streams. And if you do, please go to the introductions channel and let us know who you are. We have a template for a couple of questions that you may want to answer to introduce yourself. I like knowing who is part of the community and where you're coming from and why you're interested. So please uh, feel free to join us. Okay. Uh, Heiko. WebSockets, yes, WebSockets are very awesome, and I'm very happy you <laughs> you were trying them before. Arasto was doing WebSockets with Python. <clears throat> Am I gonna have to get take you off from the moderator list, Arasto? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Salvador, hey, good to see you again. Um, Salvador is also a, pretty much a Python person, so he's probably going to take up everything we're showing today and like rewrite it in Python and make it awesome. <laughs> All righty. Uh, okay. Yes. All righty. So where are we going to start? Mm hmm. Where are we going to start? I have a small cheat sheet of things that I want to cover here. So let me get some room. All right. All right. So the way we're going to start is where are we going to start? Um, oh, wait, where did it go? Ah, dumb. Well, does anybody have questions before we start? Um, I know there's some lag. So if you have any questions, just put them on the chat. Uh, oops, this is here. I can. And then where are we going to start? We're going to start, first of all, um, I have a list of things that I want to cover. I have an intro video. Obviously, I can pr I can probably do that by the end of the video. Um, Harasto, if you have a question about Grasshopper, perhaps that's more of uh, something that we can cover on Discord. Or, I mean, I'm going to do some social and Q&A at the end of this live stream. So maybe we can address that. So. So what is so I'm going to do? Um, we're going to start by the beginning, which is explaining what is WebSockets. And then I'm also going to we're going to be using a lot of Node.js today. So I need to explain what that is as well. And then we can get started. All right. I also have some examples that I did. Oh, and we're going to put things online using Glitch, which is really, really cool as well. So I need to explain how that works. All right. So. What is WebSockets? Let me bring on here. Um, let me bring in here. Uh, <clears throat> pp 
and then uh, some images perhaps. Um, oh, I like this image a lot. Uh, okay, and mm -hmm. um, All right. Um, did I like that image? So where's the Wikipedia page for WebSockets? Um, yeah, this is not going to give us much here. So ditched. Um, um, is this image interesting? Um, I think it, we can talk about this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Netscape. Has anyone ever here used Netscape? I used to use Net Netscape. Um, it was a lot of fun, actually. And it had its own HTML. Um, uh, you could write HTML inside of it. It was pretty cool. Uh, but, 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 but I think that's where I want to be. I know that's not what I want. Oh, maybe I want to. Maybe I want to show that. You're right. Um. Uh, yes. So I want to do that, and I want to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I don't want to show this anymore. Okay. All right. Is there anything that I want to use from here? No. Okay. So let's get started. Um, you guys excited? Woohoo! It's going to be very awesome. Um, especially, I'm really, really looking forward when we have like stuff working. And I can share the link and we can all connect and do things together and like explode the server. <laughs> mm -hmm. All righty. So <clears throat> WebSockets. All right, let's start from the beginning. So what is WebSockets in the first place? Um, the idea is that WebSockets is a communication protocol that is designed for clients and servers to talk to each other. But um, there's a long history of how this has already been implemented in the web and the internet and the networks. And actually, the H, the um, the WebSocket protocol actually lives on top of a super, super standard protocol called the HTTP protocol, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is basically the protocol on top of which the whole internet and all the websites that you can think of right now online, they work on, okay? Uh, the idea is that regular HTTP is very good for websites because um, the content and the interaction model that you typically require when you access a website is very static in nature. The idea is that when you want a website, uh, the client, which is you or your browser, um, access some server, typically the website that you type in or whatever domain name server is being assigned to your request, whatever. And when you reach that server, you basically request to be served some information. That information is typically HTML code, so the code that runs the website. Then the server sends that information back to you. And then your browser takes that HTML, renders it, and then it shows you a website. This is the super, super basic typical model on top of which 95% of the whole internet is built on. This is really good and it works really well for static content where you don't really need a lot of interaction back and forth because this interaction is based on the idea that you request the website to be sent to you and then the server 
sends you that website back. And period. That's all interaction that you need. However, when you want to engage in communication that is more data intensive or is more real time intensive, the HTTP protocol is very constrained because since it, re it requires this request and response cycle to be executed every time, so the connection needs to be established, the headers needs to be sent, blah, 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 whatever, it's actually not very optimal and not very fast. And also, in, um, for technical reasons that we're not going to get into, the connection between the client and the server when these requests happen are one of connections. The connection doesn't stay alive. There is not a tunnel, if you will, that gets established between the client and the server where communication is flowing in both directions. That is not how HTTP works. So WebSockets came in as a way of making this live, this real-time communication, this real-time data exchange between a client and a server much more optimal and faster by maintaining an active communication between the two agents in this, in this communication part. So basically, WebSocket is an extension of HTTP. It uses HTTP underneath, but it supersedes it because what it does is that once an initial HTTP connection is established, so this, this process called handshake, which basically means the client and the server exchange a couple of headers saying like, hey, can you do WebSockets? Yes, I can do WebSockets. Which version of WebSockets will you? Let's agree to use 1.1. Okay, we're good. Handshake. And then the communication starts. And once the communication starts, there is a full duplex persistent communication between the two parties, the client and the server, which means that there is a tunnel or there's a highway where data can go in both directions without needing any kind of request. So the client can send data to the server without the server specifically asking for that data and vice versa. The server can also send data back to the client without the client specifically asking for that data. This is very good because it makes data exchange and it makes the timing, the real timeness of this data exchange very fast which means that for real-time applications, it's a really, really good protocol. The, very likely, if you have ever gone to a website that had some kind of chat window or where we, you can chat and you were chatting with an agent or with other people, etc., very likely that part of the website was implemented using WebSockets protocol because it's a very standard protocol these days. And one of the very nice things about WebSocket as well is that it's a super, super standard protocol, which means that most programming languages that I can think of or much frameworks that you might be working on will be implementing some kind of WebSocket, um, will have some kind of WebSocket implementation that you will be used. Because WebSocket is not a JavaScript thing or it's a Python thing or it's a C-sharp thing. It's its own thing. It's a protocol that can be accessed using WebSocket, uh, using JavaScript, Python, C-sharp, whatever language you can think of. It's kind of a... So if we have programming languages for computers, but we have protocols for ways of making machines talk to each other. This is all will be also really great because um, we will be able to use WebSockets as a communication protocol to make different softwares, so different, um, different programming languages and different environments talk to each other. For example, we will be able to connect a JavaScript application with a Python application by connecting them with WebSockets. We will be able to make processing talk to Grasshopper, for example, by using a WebSocket server in between, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it's, I mean, uh, I don't have to disclose this, but uh, it's one of my favorite um, protocols. It's super easy to implement. It's really fast. It's very nice. It's super playful, and it also allows. It will also allow this one thing that we can also not do with HTTP, which is not only will we be able to do client-server communication on a one-to-one -one basis, but because there will be real-time communication flowing between the server and any client connecting to the server, what we will be able to do will be to connect multiple clients to the same server and then use the server as a way of exchanging data, broadcasting data that is coming from one client to the, to the rest. Again, think of the chat window, that model. That is possible because the server 
has a live connection, not just with one of the clients, but with all of them. So we will be using that in the experiments that we will be looking at in this playlist. And it's going to be super fun and super flavorful, super, um, super, <laughs> super playful. So let's move on to the next video and see um, how can we create a super simple WebSocket server. In this case, we're going to start doing it with Node.js and JavaScript. So let's first take a look at what Node.js is. Alrighty, was I recording? Yes. What is the difference? Oh, Anguito, this is great. <laughs> what is the difference between a WebSocket and a webhook? Very good question. WebSocket is a communication protocol between processes that run in machines. Okay, so if I have a server, which is a machine that is running somewhere on the cloud, uh, on Heroku, on Glitch, or whatever, um, we can run a process there that is a server. And then if we have a client, for example, your computer that connects to that server, that is another process so they can both communicate with each other. A webhook is a, um, what is the right word for this? A webhook is, I cannot find what the right technical word for is right now, but it's basically a way of raising events in particular, raising events associated to particular actions so that machines can get communication about those events. So for example, um, on GitHub, which is a repository for open source uh, or closed source to, uh, uh, on, on GitHub, which is a repository for code, you can create a webhook so that whenever someone pushes commits to that repository, the webhook raises notifications and communicates to other processes and other machines that are connected to that webhook that something has happened. For example, there have been new commits. So think of webhooks as um, a way of subscribing to getting notifications from a particular service whenever something specific happens in that service. So for example, um, this is very used in social networks or for bots, for example, whenever somebody posts, if you have a webhook and you pay premium on Instagram, uh, you can get a notification whenever you post or whenever somebody posts, and then you can write a bot to do something in response to that. This is very useful because otherwise the only way you would have to know if somebody has posted to Instagram, like yourself or somebody else is to like, I don't know, every minute to go to the, to that user's profile and check if there's a new post. So you can imagine how resource intensive that is and how very likely Instagram is going to ban you if they detect that one bot is pinging the service every minute and every minute. So yes, Victor, webhook is kind of like an event trigger. It's just that it's not contained on the same machine. It's typically triggering events between different machines and different services that are not living on the same space. That's kind of how it works. For example, um, I am in the Discord channel here. In the Discord channel, in announcements, I have a bot that takes a look at the Twitter account for Parametric Camp and to the Instagram account to Parametric Camp. And it uses web hooks to communicate with the Discord bot. So I use Sapier, which looks at my Twitter and my, and my Instagram account. And Sapier has web hooks that I use to notify the Discord bot that it needs to create a new post because somebody has, for example, posted on, on, on Twitter starting in one hour, etc. So this is run with web hooks. That, this, that, that makes, does, does that make sense? <laughs> All right. So while you think if that makes sense or not, let's talk about Node.js. Um, and let me see if there's a nice diagram or something that I can use. Uh, Node.js. Uh, um. mm -hmm. All right. 
So this is bang, the Wikipedia page is a little boring. Um, no JS. What is this? Ah, uh, this is a little chatbot. Well, yeah. I mean, why not? It's kind of nice. It's a nice diagram. Um, mm -mm. No JS. Yeah. Well, this is lame. Okay. Okay, and then this diagram. Yes. All right. So I'm going to go get some water. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. The fun is gonna is about to start. Alrighty, and the microphone. Okay, so what is Node? <laughs> um, what? Well, let me say what is Node. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, no, 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 no. Is there some nice introduction? Mm. What is exactly is Node.js? Ooh, like, tell me exactly what it is. All right, well. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yes, we can probably start here. All right, let's do this. Stop. Um, okay. Are we all good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are we going to say? Um, we're going to say what is what is node? Um, um, it's a uh, JavaScript runtime, it allows to execute node. Uh, okay. It's a, um, it's a synchronous event driven. Mm -hmm. So it's particularly good for, uh, I see. Mm. Uh, not imperative, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's based on JavaScript. Which is awesome. <laughs> not not Python. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, er, 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 er. okay. All right. <clears throat> B 
Before we start uh, programming anything, let's spend a few minutes talking about what Node.js actually is, because um, I think we're going to be using it a lot in this uh, in this list of tutorials. So um, so let's let's spend a minute talking about it. Um, the official definition of what Node.js is is that it is a asynchronous event driven JavaScript runtime. Uh, build, design to build, amazing, blah, 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 whatever. But what does that even mean? Um, the idea is that Node.js, the idea is that when JavaScript as a language was born, it was designed to be a language that was going to be fueling and was going to be powering all the interactivity that was to be embedded in websites online on the internet in the world. And uh, because it was very, very strongly designed to be living uh, in embedded in a website or as part of a website, when it was born, it was not conceived really as, a, as an all purpose language, or as a general language that could also be used for things that didn't have to do with the front end of your website. So for example, um, back in the times, JavaScript could only be used for websites, but it could not be used, for example, to create a server or to manipulate files on your computer or to uh, process images to do things that didn't have to do exactly with showing or manipulating a web page online. So uh, around 2010, somebody, um, I forget his name, uh, I think you can Google that, came up with the idea of like, why not create a runtime so that we can execute JavaScript code stand alone without relying on that code being attached to a website. So Node.js was born and it was born as a runtime because what runtime means is that it's basically Node.js is a program that allows you to run JavaScript code. It's very similar to when you're working with Python and then you type Python and then you type the name of a script that you want to execute and Python executes that Python script, right? It's very similar. Um, what's interesting about Node.js is that it's very asynchronous and is very event driven, as opposed to other programming languages that are very imperative. So they rely very strongly on a set um, and a set program with a bunch of lines of code one after the other. What's very special about Node.js is that it's built around the concept of asynchronicity at its core. So it's really good at, um, at creating programs that instead of relying on executing all the lines of code one by one, what they do in a way is that they start processes or they have um, a non-sequential way of dealing with that program. And then when things happen, so it is event driven, whenever events happen in that program, the program knows how to react or how to execute code that responds in response to those events. But that doesn't mean that those events need to be executed in the order that they were written when in the script that is running on Node.js. So, but why is this important? Well, it turns out that, for example, for servers, it's actually really good to have an event driven runtime because a server is basically a process is a program that is running on some machine on the cloud, which most of the time is just doing nothing. It's just waiting for a connection to come in. And then when the connection come in, it needs to do some handshakes, some connection, etc, etc. And then when that connection has been established, depending on what is what the client or what the connection wants, it needs to respond to that connection or to those requests in different ways. So it turns out that, for example, for creating uh, web servers or for creating WebSocket servers, it's actually really, really nice um, because it is event driven and it is asynchronous at its core. The downside of that is that is sometimes uh, if you want to write applications that are very um, imperative, so one thing after another, etc., sometimes it could get tricky because a lot of the functionality and a lot of the code that comes out of the box is asynchronous. So what that means is that when it executes, maybe you're, <laughs> you're maybe you start um, maybe you start executing a chunk of code 
that will be executed after all the lines of code after that one have been executed. We're not going to get into that very much in this series, I think. Um, but, um, but long story short, with Node.js, you can run JavaScript code. And we will see how to do that in this series. And um, it's very nice because it's asynchronous and it is event driven. Okay, so I found this diagram here that tells us like, oh, Node.js is really cool for real time data, for chatbots, for web scraping, for REST APIs, uh, data streaming, blah, 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 which is kind of true. It's really good for creating a lot of services and a lot of programs which are meant to live in the cloud and which are meant to uh, have a this kind of asynchronous um, life cycle. If you want to write an application where you just want to go through a bunch of data and process that data and get some results and stuff, then perhaps Node.js is not your answer. Then perhaps in that case, uh, you're probably going to go for Python or for any of those other um, programming languages. Okay. So in the next video, let's take a look at how to install Node.js in our system and how to make sure that it's working and how to do like a very simple example on how to write um, a few lines of code with the REPL. Let's take a look at that. All righty. So let's do it. Let's do it, right? <clears throat> okay. Oh, I'm going to <laughs> move this here. Yes. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> awesome. Let's take a look at how to install Node.js on our system and how to make sure that it's working and how to do like a simple a simple example with um, with the interactive with the interactive console. Okay, so in, in Windows it's that easy. Uh, so you basically go to nodejs.org and then you will be prompted with this with this um, landing page and um, this is how you download uh, Node.js for Windows. If you don't know what you're doing or if you're not an advanced user or you don't want the latest feature, I very strongly recommend you. You stick to the LTS, so the more stable release, uh, like this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just double click, click one here. I'm going to save this file somewhere on my desktop, okay? And then that's going to download, and it's going to take a couple seconds here. And then I just downloaded the installer. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to double click on the installer. This window is going to pop up, and then I'm going to say yes. Uh, let's do this. Uh, it's taking a little bit. Yes, so we want to install. I accept the terms of agreement. Let's do it here. And then this is the part that I wanted to cover. So we're going to start, ev we're going to install everything. We're going to install the packet manager NPM. Uh, I don't care whether if you do online documentation or not, but this is very important. We need to add Node.js to the path. What that means is that um, Node.js will change the standard path in our windows, and we'll add a link to where Node.js lives on our system. This is important because we want our system to know where Node.js lives so that we can use it from any folder or from anywhere in our, in our computer. Um, I'll show you what that means in a second. So I'm going to go yes, and then some NPM modules need to be compiled uh, from C++, whatever. So um, this one, depending on how much you have coded or not, um, I, you may have these tools already or not. So I'm going to recommend in your case that you do install the necessary tools, even though I'm not going to do it because um, I have a lot of stuff going on in my computer already. So uh, I'm going to recommend that you actually do this. And then we're going to install this. Space requirements is going to do its thing, blah, blah, blah. Let's, it's okay. All right, remove files, etc. And then something that I'm going to do in the meantime, I'm going to open an explorer window and I'm going to show you 
where that path that we were referring to lives. So for example, if we, I right click on my PC and I click on, um, on properties, you can see that if I go to advanced system settings and I go to environment variables, you can see that there's this thing called the path here. If I double click on the path, this is a list of all the programs that are publicly accessible in my computer and that I can access from anywhere in any terminal. You can see that Node.js has itself added as part of the path. So this is good. Uh, and that's what we want. And you can see that here, the Node.js has finished um, uh, installing. So we're good, etc. And then let's see if that worked. Okay. The way we're going to do that is we're going to open a terminal, a command prompt in our Windows machine. I'm going to be doing these tutorials for, for Windows. I don't have a Mac. I'm sorry, but it's not, it's not very difficult to do it in Mac either. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to do Windows search. And then you can see it is on my other screen, but this search window pops up and I'm going to type CMD or command prompt. And as I do that, this thing shows up here. This is my command prompt and I'm going to make the text a little larger so that we can all see better, right? As we do that, um, as we do that, you can see that um, I am now on my system and I'm in this folder, users JLX. The, um, the way to check if Node.js is here or not is by typing Node. And then for example, we're going to ask which version have we installed. So I'm going to do hyphen and I'm going to type a V. And if I do that, you can see that right now I am running version 14, 15, 5, which it is exactly what I just installed. Okay. So that is good. That means that node is running on our system. And um, as I said, node is a runtime, which means that it can execute no, um, it can execute JavaScript scripts but it can also work as a REPL, which um, I forget what the REPL stands for. Read, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, read, evaluate and print loop. What that means is that we can open an interactive node session. If I type node, we enter this interactive session where I can write native JavaScript code. So for example, let's say I'm going to declare a variable called sum that I'm going to say it's going to be 10 plus 23. All right. And then if I now console log the value of sum, I get the value of 33. So and then here I could just declare a function function something something function, for example, sum a and b is going to be equal to return a plus b. Okay. And then I just, uh, oh yeah, because I can't do that because I already have a variable called sum. Um, so if I can, I'm going to call this add. All right. So now I have a function called add and I can say sum is going to be equal to the addition of 26 and 78. And now I get that console log, the value of sum has now changed to 100, 104. All right. So I have this interactive a console that I can use to type JavaScript code, to execute JavaScript code and to try things out. Um, this is good for uh, beginners, for learning, etc. But it's typically not how we will use node. We will use node. Uh, I'm going to press uh, control C two times so that I leave um, that interactive REPL. The typical way we will do, um, uh, we will execute node is by saying, can by using node to run another a different JavaScript file. So for example, uh, test file .js, this does not exist on my computer yet. But and then it will tell me like, Oh, I cannot find this thing, etc. Because it's not there. But this is the typical way we will use node to run JavaScript scripts, very similar to how we typically do Python and then something.py and then we execute a Python script. All right, it's very similar. So, all right. So now that we know, now that we have node on our system and we know that it's working, 
How about we start creating our first uh, node application, which is going to be a simple WebSocket server. So before we do that, let me show you the best way that I think it is to start a simple uh, node application. Let's take a look at that on the next video. All righty. Hey, Rafael. Welcome, man. It's been a long time. So what, how was this? Was this clear? Uh, did you all have, do you all have Node.js working uh, on your, on your end? Is it good? Uh, any questions? Who, can you raise your hand if you have ever done JavaScript, some kind of JavaScript, or can you thumbs down if you haven't? Um, which is also fine. <laughs> Um, all right. So what's on my list? Uh, what is WebSockets? What is Node.js? How to install Node.js? This was clear. Thank you, Benson. Um, creating an app in Node.js. All right. So let's do that. Am I going to use command prompt or am I going to use PowerShell? I'm going to use PowerShell. Uh, let me configure this before color. The color is going to be black. The font is going to be 20. All right. And then, yes. All right. The errors look so worthy. What errors? Ah, oh, the, um, hmm. Okay. NPM. Okay. Um, my neighbor is shoveling the 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 snow. Tariq, what, what is that sad face that you have never used JavaScript or that you're <laughs> or that you're struggling to get this to get this working? <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to create a folder. Mm, right, I'm going to call it WebSockets. All right, so I'm going to put it here. Does clicking on the Windows Start symbol open the menu on this screen? Oh my God, you're genius, Heiko. That was awesome. That is awesome. I had no idea you could do that. That was very good, Heiko. Thank you so lot. Mm -hmm -hmm. Very good. Very good. I love that. Installing the additional tool and giving this super long error message. Ignore it. Um, Victor, I guess so. Um, in... <clears throat> In reality, you only need that for, you only need those additional tools for specific modules that need to be compiled for your machine. Um, typically, that's only like 10, 20% of the modules and it's very specific ones. So you, if that doesn't work, just go, just go forward without that installation and without that extra installation and that should be fine. Heiko, super thumbs up. I had no idea you could do this. So now I can do PowerShell. All right. This is great. Okay. I love that. Mm -hmm. So I created this and then WebSocket. Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I have this on my desktop. I have this on my desktop. Uh, and then I can create a folder. Mm -hmm. All righty. And uh, we're going to do that by mm -hmm -hmm. 
And then here I have, what do I have here? Uh, mm -hmm. All right. I think, okay. Oh, Benson, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, so they're not the same thing. Uh, think of PowerShell as an evolved version of the command prompt. So command prompt works purely on MS DOS, whereas PowerShell integrates all this new stuff that is very inspired by Unix systems, by Linux. Uh, and it's just much, much nicer because whenever you do machine communication with anything, you're always going to be working in Linux. So it's a good thing to get used to. All right, so let's start the project. <clears throat> How are we going to do this? Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at what I feel is one of the best ways to start a simple Node.js application, which is using NPM as an initializer to that application. Let me explain what that means. So what I have done is I have here my desktop and I've created this folder called WS for WebSockets. And what I would like to do here is I would like to create a bunch of small projects that are the WebSocket server, WebSocket client, processing, Grasshopper, all this stuff. We're just going to throw it in here. Okay. And you can see that this WebSocket folder is living right now on my user folder and on my desktop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a command prompt. So I'm going to go to my Windows, um, to my Windows, to my Windows um, icon, and then you can start typing the program that you want to search on your machine. So typically, I could type CMD to get a command prompt. But in this case, I like on Windows, I like much, much better Windows PowerShell. So this is what I'm going to do. And it's just open on my other screen. So I'm going to dock it here on the right end of my screen. PowerShell is like CMD is like a command prompt, but it's a more evolved version of, of it. So it has way more features that are closer to Linux systems than they are to uh, old MS DOS. So maybe I I should record a video about this at some point. But anyway, so you can see that right now I am on users JLX. So I can type DIR to see anything, everything that is on my folder, or I can type LS, which is the Unix way of doing this, which you can only do on PowerShell. You could not do that on CMD. You can see that I have a my desktop folder. So I'm going to type CD desktop. You can see that I could type DE and autocomplete with the tab to find the closest match to that. And I can also type CDWS. So let me go back one. So I'm going to type LS to see everything that is on my desktop. You can see I have a lot of stuff. So I'm just going to type CDWS, which is the folder that I have here. And you can see that as I type LS, there is nothing on my folder, which is empty. So what I can do is I'm going to type, um, I'm going to I'm going to create a new folder, which is going to be a it's going to be the WebSocket server that I'm I, I'm creating for this example. So for example, I'm going to type here MD, and I'm going to type the name of the folder that I want to create, which is going to be um, server um, echo, I'm going to create an echo server. All right. And then I'm going to type CD, and I'm going to get into that server into that folder by typing the first few letters, and then pressing tab to auto complete for the rest. And now you can see that I am inside of server echo, you can see that also this got just got created, I can see it on my Windows part. And I am ready to use this folder to initialize a node application. The way I'm going to do this is by using what's called npm. npm is the packet, the package manager that comes with node.js. You can think of it as the as the pip. Uh, if you're familiar with Python, it's basically the pip of Node.js. Is the application that we use to manage and to install 
packages, all right? If you're interested in what that is, you can go to NPM and there's a lot of documentation and you can search here for packages. For example, I'm going to type WS, which is the main, the, one of the most popular packages for doing WebSockets, which we're going to be using a lot in this tutorial, okay? Um, so, and what's interesting is that NPM, for example, if I do NPM slash V, I can see which version of NPM I have installed which you already have on your system, because if you follow my previous video where we installed Node.js, NPM comes with any installation of Node.js and it's already part of your system. So you don't need to take special care to install that, um, to install that on your end. Now, NPM is really good at initializing projects, applications, because what it does is it creates a few files that are very necessary to maintain any node application and all the dependencies that that application needs in order to execute. The way we do that is by, I'm going to clean this screen by doing CLS, and then I'm going to initialize a new application by typing npm init. As I do that, okay, this utility is going to walk me through a bunch of things that I need to specify um, what are the properties and what are the parameters and the dependencies of my application. So the package manager name is going to be server echo, whatever, version 1.0, the description, some nice text here, whatever. Uh, the entry point is some JavaScript file, which I don't have on my system yet. I'm going to, I know that the file is going to be called server.js. So why not just write it right now? The entry point, the main file in my application is going to be called server.js. Test command, we don't need to care about that. There's no Git repository yet for this. Keywords, author, license, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And if this is okay, we hit yes. And then you can see that, um, you can see that NPM has created this new file on my application called package.json. And if I double click on that, it will be open. Let me actually do this the right way. So I'm going to open on my system a the code editor that I typically use which is Visual Studio Code, specifically for JavaScript files. It's, um, so I'm going to put it in here, and then I'm going to drop this here. You can see that what NPM created is this one file called package.json, which incorporates all the information that my application needs in order to start, to install dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. This may not be very obvious uh, right now, but um, we will see the, the utility of how this is useful very, very soon. Because for example, um, a, if I want to install a package for my application to use, I will need to use it to install it through the packet manager. So for example, as I said, we are going to be doing a lot of WebSocket examples in the videos that are coming up on this playlist. So I'm going to be using a lot of this one package, which you can see is extremely popular, which is a WebSocket library for Node.js. It's called just WS. So um, if I want to install that library on my application, the only thing I need to do is I need to type npm i, which stands for install, and then the name of the package. As I do that, see what it's going, I would like you to notice what is going to happen on my package JSON file. If I do here and I type npm install, and then the name of the package that I want to install, WS, then NPM takes care of going online, finding somewhere, whatever, and installing that on my system. You can see that NPM has changed the JSON file and has added this part here. Now my project has a dependency, which is the WebSocket module, and it specifies which version I'm using here. You may also notice that if you go to the folder, with your project, you will also notice that now I have this new folder called node modules, which includes WS, which includes all the files that are necessary for that module to execute. So now any application that I might create here with Node.js will have access to the functionality that is coming with the package. And what's very interesting as well is that now anytime I take this whole code, including package.js, package.json, and I put it somewhere on the cloud or anywhere, 
that where a Node.js can be hosted, then that hosting will know that in order for my Node.js code to run, it will need to install these dependencies that are um, that are mandatory for my project. So this is a really good way. I, so I, I will not need to upload all the modules myself. The only thing that I will need to upload to my cloud hosting, which will, which, which will be the package.json uh, file. Also, very typically, let's say I were to delete all these modules, OK? Um, my dependencies are still here. But it so happens that when people share Node.js um, projects between them, very typically you don't bundle all the Node modules themselves because they're very. It takes a lot of space. There's like thousands of files. It's just not nice. So what people do is they just share the core code and they share the package.json file. And then when you take that on your machine, what you do is you use this file to install all the dependencies that your module, that your application needs. So for example, the way to do that is imagine somebody just gave me this code. And I have no idea of what do I need to install. If there were like 17 different dependencies, I'm not going to go into the file and start typing them one by one. What I do is I simply type npm install. And then npm will know, will try to find the package.json file take a look at all the dependencies and install them all one by one. So you can see that by installing npm i without specifying the package, node, sorry, npm has figured out all the dependencies and has have installed them on my system. So now I'm ready to run whatever code I just have downloaded, which I don't have anything right now, but I will do in a second. Okay. So, um, all right. So we have all we need to actually start writing real code. So how about we do that? Let's move on to the next video where we're going to write a very simple WebSocket server. We're going to execute it, we're going to run it, and then we're going to test it and see if it works. Okay, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. All righty. Okay, I one minute, I'll be right back. You hoo hoo. How's everyone doing? Huh? Are you excited about what's coming? Huh? <laughs> Woo hoo. Okay, so let us write a simple WebSocket server. Um, how are we going to do that? Um, so I'm going to. Mm hmm. Okay, so for this, I'm going to need to assume that you know how to write basic JavaScript, which might not be the case, but um, I don't really have a learning JavaScript um, playlist, which I should definitely do because I love JavaScript and I love all things uh, Node.js. So, but Daniel Schiffman, has a ton of video have has a ton of videos doing um, JavaScript. So I think I'm 
a much better use of my time at right now is like creating other kinds of contents. But anyway, um, so where was I? So we're going to create a, um, we're going to create a, yes, we're, <clears throat> we're going to create, um, we're going to create uh, the WebSocket server. <clears throat> so for this video, I'm going to assume that people might just might just might just have dropped from I don't know from like a Google search or something. So I'm going to specify what have we done so far, um, so that people can just check previous videos or something like that. Um, all right. I'm going to, I need to also take care of time because I have a meeting at noon. So I'm going to have a sharp, I'm going to have a hard end at noon, but then we can start again in the afternoon, 2 p.m. Mm, 2 p.m. Boston time. So what are we doing? How are we going to start this? Um, how are we going to do this? We're going to do this by, I'm going to specify, uh, what are we going to do? And then I'm going to create the server.js file. Uh, I'm going to do this, this manually from Visual Studio, or I'm going to also do it uh, the hacky way from the terminal, which is kind of cool. And then I'm going to explain that uh, I'm going to explain how to create the server and how to deal with connections. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so, um, all right, let's do that. <clears throat> oh, I also need, we need to check that this works. We're going to do that by using a Chrome extension. Um, okay. Hi, and welcome to this video where we're going to implement a super simple WebSocket server that is going to echo whatever is coming from the client and it's going to send it back. And we're going to be doing that using Node.js. Um, this video is part of a longer series. It's, I think it's going to be called Fun with WebSockets or Creative Stuff with WebSockets. I don't know. Um, but uh, long story short, we're going to start this video by, um, we already have a setup. We have Node.js installed in our system and we have created the basic structure for a Node.js application, including the packages. And we have installed the WebSocket server package. So if you want to know how that is done, please go back, go to the playlist and check out my previous videos on how to get set up. Okay. So we're right here now at the time where we're about to start writing the actual code for the server. And for these videos, I'm going to assume that you have some familiarity with JavaScript. But if you don't, um, you're welcome to check Daniel Schiffman's videos on learning JavaScript. Uh, or hopefully, if you see this in like long, long in the future, I may already have made a playlist on how to learn JavaScript and how to use it in Node.js. Okay, so let's get started. The we have I have a folder. It's called server echo. I already have a package file that has information about the project. And I already have dependencies. As dependencies, I have the WebSocket package that I'm going to be used through, using throughout this project. Now, the main entry file 
for this application is going to be one file called server.js, which I still don't have in my system. So there's two ways to do this. Uh, so for example, I could go to Visual Studio, create a new file, so file, new file, and then save this file in my server echo folder and call it, for example, server.js, all right? And if we do that, you can see that now I have the server.js file, which is empty, but uh, Visual Studio is already giving me highlighting for JavaScript files. However, um, I want to show you the cool hacky way of doing this, which is when you install Visual Studio Code on your system, Visual Studio Code also has a way of being accessed through the terminal. So here on my right hand side, I have PowerShell, right, uh, which is living on the folder where I have my code. So the server echo folder. So what I can do is when you install Visual Studio Code, you are given this new command called code, which uh, gives you access to functionality from Visual Studio Code. So what you can do is from the terminal, you can type code and you can say, for example, server.js. And what that will do is that it will create a new file, whatever that is, so in server echo, and then it will call it server.js, all right? And it will open Visual Studio right away with that file. So if I save this file now, you can see that this file has been saved to WebSocket server echo. And now I'm ready to start typing here um, JavaScript code. So console log, for example, hello WebSocket server, right? And I'm going to uh, save this. And then from my command line, I can type node and then I can type server and press tab to autocomplete. And you can see that node just executed the code in my server file, which is basically just a simple dump on the console. So um, I have now a very simple node application with one line of code, uh, like a hello world kind of thing, which I can execute from my runtime, which is Node.js. Again, with Node.js, I can type Node, and then I can type the name of any JavaScript file, and it will execute the code in that JavaScript file. We've seen that in previous videos, I believe. Okay, so at this point, we are ready to start writing the code for our WebSocket server. So the first thing that we're going to do is in our, in our code, I'm going to remove this. And then what I'm going to do is, first of all, remember how we said that we created, we imported um, this dependency, the WebSocket library. The first thing that I need to do is to bring in all the code of that WebSocket library into my application. The way to do that is I'm going to create a variable that is going to be a constant, so const, and I'm going to call it WebSocket. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to import all the code that is living on my WebSocket library. So I can do that with require and then type in the name of the library that I'm importing. And I have a typo here, WebSocket, all right? If I do that, now I have my WebSocket server, uh, sorry, I have my WebSocket library there, which I can use to create a new server. Uh, creating a server is like a super, super easy thing. So for example, I'm going to create a new variable called WebSocket server. And then I'm going to use the WebSocket object to create a server. So I'm going to say new WebSocket dot server. And then here you can see that the constructor of this object takes some options. The options are typically a JavaScript object, something like this. So I can open and close curly brackets. And in here, I can specify any information that I want to pass into the constructor for, um, for uh, to, to give me information about what kind of server do I want to create. Uh, one super, super basic thing that we will always need to handle when creating servers, serv servers is which port those servers are going to be living on. Um, we're not going to get into the details of that much, but for this example that is going to be living on my machine for the time being, uh, we're going to choose some any random value. So for example, I'm going to just choose 5,000. Okay. And that's going to be that's going to be fine. So as I do that, you can see that my WebSocket server 
has been created. And then um, just for the sake of making sure that we have things under control uh, and we have some feedback, I'm going to dump some message that says, hey, we started, we're listening, etc., etc." So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to log, for example, um, I'm going to say new date so that I get um, so that I get information about new date and then here server is listening on port um, 5000, for example. And actually, let's why don't we do this a bit more programmatic? So I'm going to declare a new variable called the port and that's going to be port 5000. I'm going to use that as the object that I create the server with. And then here, I'm just going to use that also to specify what are we, um, what are we, what are we spitting up? Let's take a look, let's save this. And then let's see if it works. So I'm going to execute this server again. And it looks like things are working. So I have a dump here that says blah, 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 time, whatever, February 19th, if you're watching this from the future, 2021, great year <laughs> so far. Uh, and then the server is listening on this particular port. And I want you to notice how the program, the script has not ended. You see this blinky cursor here? That means that my server is alive, uh, even though uh, it kind of has e finished executing all this code. But this is part of what I was talking about in the previous video, uh, because it's an asynchronous event driven uh, runtime, Node.js then it's very useful for applications that um, simply just wait uh, for things to happen and then react to those things. Like, for example, a WebSocket server. So my WebSocket server right now is waiting for incoming connections. It's just um, that there's no incoming connection. So let's, um, let's, let's do something with this, okay? So first of all, let's test that this WebSocket server is actually valid and it's running. The way I'm going to do that is by using a test WebSocket client and use that to connect to my server. How am I going to do that? Um, we're going to write an actual WebSocket client in the next videos. But for the sake of speed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Chrome. And in Chrome, let's, um, I already have it installed, but uh, for example, uh, Chrome extensions, WebSocket client. And if you do that, you will probably land into this application, which is kind of very popular. So I already have it on my Chrome, but you would have here a button that says install, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, uh, which I already have it here. So under extensions, I have a simple WebSocket client, which I can use to test connecting to a WebSocket server. Now, if I click on the WebSocket client, I get to this window right here that um, gives me, asks me for some information. So where is that server located? Well, um, because right now my server, which is this node application that is running here, and my client, which is the Chrome extension plugin, they're both different processes. One is the server, the other one is the client, but they're both living on the same physical machine, which is my computer. When that happens, what I need to do is I need to specify an IP that means don't go anywhere in the wild, don't go to the internet, just stay here on my local machine. That IP is typically referred to as localhost, and the number for that IP on every machine on the world is 127 dot zero dot zero dot one. This very particular sequence of numbers, 127001, is the IP of a local host, which we always use to refer to any process that is living on the same machine where the process that we're specifying is living. If we want to connect to a WebSocket server that lives somewhere on the cloud, it will be uh, a different thing. So, we need to specify that. And because we are on the same machine as well, we also need to specify the port on which my WebSocket server is living. So I'm going to write a colon, so two dots, and then I'm going to specify here 5000, which is the port on which 
my WebSocket server is leaving. If I click open, uh, this should open. All right. And it looks like it's working, even though I don't really get any feedback here. We're going to work on that. And then I'm going to send a request like, hello, server. And then I'm going to send this. This is what I sent, but I also don't get anything in response. Why is that? Well, this is because I have created probably the most stupid WebSocket server, which is a WebSocket that is running, but it's doing absolutely nothing. Uh, it doesn't listen to connections. It doesn't send anything back. It's just the dumbest uh, server ever. So what I would like to do is I would like to actually write some code on the server that listens to connections to incoming stuff and then is able to respond back to that stuff. The, what we're going to do is we're going to implement an echo server, which is a really simple way of uh, implementing a basic WebSocket server. An echo server is any server that responds to the client with exactly whatever the client has sent to the server. So if the client sends hello, the server will respond hello. If it says whatever, blah, 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 it will respond the same thing. And actually, out there in the world, in the wild, there is a very popular debugging WebSocket server out there, which is called the Echo server. So WebSocket Echo. Um, yes. So you can see here in WebSocket, which is, I guess, the organization that runs this. Um, here, this is the address of a permanent WebSocket Echo server that lives in, in, in the cloud. So if I go back to my, if I close my connection, my simple WebSocket client, and now I replace this with an actual WebSocket server that is living on the cloud. For this one, I don't need to specify the port. So if I open this, you can see that I just uh, open this server. And then now I can send this message to hello server and hello server responded with the same thing. So I say, hi server. And I send this, the server responds with the exact same thing. Uh, boo. <laughs> and then I get the same response. Okay. So this is happening because I'm connecting to some server in the, in out there in the wild, in the internet that is doing this echo logic. So, all right. So I probably want to implement the same thing here on my own server. So um, let's take a look at how to do that. All right, I needed a breath. I've been talking for, what is that? 10 minutes already? Uh, okay. <clears throat> so what am I going to do now? How are we doing? Um, you excited? Um, I want to finish with at least the client before we, um, before we go, before we were very, before we break for lunch. So let me, hmm. let me do, um, okay. So how are we going to do that? Mm hmm. Okay. Oh, all right. JB. Uh, yes, very good question. WS means an unsecure WebSocket connection. And WSS, it means a secure WebSocket connection. It's the same as HTTP or HTTPS. Exact same thing. All righty. So, Let's get to this. So um, uh, we're going to implement echo on the server. And I, I think I was doing this with my finger. <laughs> this is for editing when we edit the video. So so that there is no. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to our server code. Let me disconnect from the WebSocket, the Echo server, whatever. Let, let me minimize this. And let me also stop the server process that is running on my machine, my machine by pressing Control C to stop the process. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write now some code that um, 
that I'm going to write the logic that I want to embed in my WebSocket server. What I'm going to do, well, the way this works, and this is very specific um, to the way JavaScript works, is that it's going to, we're going to be doing this by implementing events. Events means uh, that we can write code that instead of just executing on a loop infinitely, what it does is it listens to specific things happening. And whenever those things happen, they execute a function that responds to that event. All right. So very typically in JavaScript, uh, the way we do that is, for example, we have the WebSocket server object, right? So if I click dot, it probably has a bunch of uh, properties. And one of them is called on. On is super, super typical for um, defining the behavior that should happen whenever uh, an event is raised. So uh, there's typically a lot of verbs. So for example, um, we will see this better on the client side. But for example, for the server, a very typical event is a connection. So you can see that there are other events like close, error, headers, listening, whatever. But uh, if I open and close curly brackets and I choose connection, then I can specify here a function that is typically referred to as the callback which is a function that will be executed whenever a connection is established to the server. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write function and then I open and going to close parentheses and I'm going to open and close curly brackets. All right. Now, this function, when Node.js executes this function, is going to give this function some data to work with. And the data is going to be an object that is representing the incoming client that is connecting to the server. That object we typically refer to as the socket. Uh, so for a WebSocket server, a WebSocket server will have a lot of sockets connecting to that client, sorry, to that server. And then we will be able to use those objects, so those sockets, as a way to interface with the clients. So I'm going to name this the socket. All right. And then here inside of the function, I'm going to add behavior and I'm going to add code that needs to run whenever any socket, um, whenever any socket uh, connects to this server. So something very simple that I'm going to do, I'm going to say console log a client just connected. And I'm also going to do the, the yes, a client just connected right now, for example. So let me save this. Uh, let me run the server. And then let me go back to uh, I'm actually going to can I dock this here, I'm going to run this all the way up here, I'm going to show how you how to do this in web in Visual Studio, actually, because it's much nicer. Ah, all right. <laughs> and then there you go. So now I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to type WS for WebSocket 1927001 and then 5000. Okay, I'm going to open the connection and I would like you to see if we get any response as we get a connection. So I'm going to open and you see that a client just connected, which means that this function executed whenever um, the client just connected. And then I, if I send stuff now, mm, still not responding in this echo way. It's not responding because so I'm going to stop the server and I'm going to close the connection as well. It's not responding because right now we've only implemented this very simple uh, uh, speed, uh, some feedback on the console. And then what we want to do is we want to attach some behavior to the incoming socket. What that means is that whenever what I would like to do is I would like to program something so that whenever I get information, whenever I get any data coming in from the socket from the client, then what I would like is to do something. So the way I do that is also using events. So to this socket to the socket that just connected, you can see that I also have the on method. The on method allows me to uh, if I open, you see, there is all this different um, there's all these different events that I can respond to um, 
for this for the socket. So whenever, for example, I get a message coming in from this socket, from this client, then what I would like to do is I would like to respond with some uh, with some inform with with another function, with another callback function. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to define another function, and then I'm going to open and close parentheses, open and close curly brackets, and then here in the information. Whenever I know, if I look at the documentation, I know that uh, this function, whenever it's executed, Node will also give this function, this callback function, some information. And for this particular event, for message, it's going to be the actual message that was received in the server by the client. So let's make a very simple thing. So for example, whenever I receive a message from any client, I'm just going to print to the console um received message from client and then i'm going to print out that message all right and i'm going to close here i'm going to save this and i'm going to execute my server again my server is running okay so now i'm going to open my connection the client just connected and then i'm going to send data to my server so i'm going to send this boo and you can see that now the server is responding with an action whenever it's receiving a message, which is printing that message to the console. So for example, another message, I'm going to send that, and you can see how it shows up here, the server is, the server is acknowledging and getting that information. And if I type whatever thing, uh, I send that to the server, and the server is picking it up and printing to the console. All right, so we're almost there. Now the only thing that we need is to do the echo part. So now what we need is to send back to the client the same message that was sent. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do this here. In wherever, inside of the function, whenever we receive a message, what I want is to respond to that client, to that socket with the same message. So the way to do that is by taking to the socket, can I send that message back. So on the same socket, I'm going to do is I'm going to use the send method to send that very same piece of information back to the user. All right. Or just to make it a bit clearer, not the exact same one. Um, take this back. And then I'm going to send the same thing with this um, with this prefix, okay, which is not exactly an echo, but uh, you get so I'm going to stop my server. I'm going to clean my screen. I'm going to start the server again. And then I'm going to close my connection, open my connection, clear this thing and say, for example, hello, right? And then I'm going to send this. This got picked up by the server. And you can see that now the server is responding with another message that says, take this back, hello. And I can now type anything. I can send a boo and then send it, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that now the communication is working. The server is listening for incoming connections. The server is listening to, um, is listening to messages that are coming and is sending those messages back to the same socket, the same client that, uh, that connected. And what's beautiful about this as well is that I can do this with multiple clients. So I'm going to keep this one open here, but I'm going to open a new tab where I'm going to open another socket client. Oops, I cannot do that. So can I do this on a different? Yes, so I'm going to have two different sockets here. All right, so 127001, all right. I'm going to open the connection and you see another client just connected and I'm going to say hello from the other client. And I'm going to send this message. I just received the message from the other client. It sent it back. Hey, I am still here. And then I'm going to send that. And I'm also receiving that message from the other. So both clients are now connected and sending information back and forth with the server. All right. So beautiful. So wait, but um. Could we use this as a way of having both clients 
do this kind of chat, for example. Um, let me show you how to rewrite this server so that whenever a client sends information, that information is broadcast to all the sockets. Let me show you how that works. All right, we're almost there. Woohoo! Um, all right, so I need to actually look that up. <laughs> NPM WebSocket, because uh, I always forget. But yep, uh, so I'm looking this up right now. And you want to, um, I'm looking at the GitHub repo for the, for the project, which has documentation on how to do a lot of other examples, etc. So you may want to, if you're really interested, I, you probably want to check this out. And then sending information, client authentication, server broadcast. This is what we want. Okay. So um, what we want is this kind of stuff. So whenever a message comes in, I want to go over all the other clients that are connected and send them this information. So let me do this very quick here. Okay. So where was I? Arasto, I'm happy to see you're excited. <laughs> All right. The way to do that is we're going to go back to the server. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to let me minimize all this stuff. Um, let me stop the server. And then I'm going to modify something here. So instead of sending the information back to the same socket to the same client, who is sending information to the server, what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate over all the clients that are connected to the server, and I'm going to send that message to each one of them. But how do I know how many clients do I have or how do I access them? Where it turns out that this particular library has a very nice way of doing that, which is I'm going to broadcast that message to all connected clients. The way to do that is by saying, let me take a look at the WebSocket server, which has a property that is called clients. Clients is basically an array that has a copy of each one of the sockets that has connected to this server. And because it's an array, I can do things such as, for example, iterating for each one of them. So for each one of them, I can give, I can, I can give it a function that will be executed with each one of the clients. So that's going to be a function. And the information that is given to the callback function is a copy of that client. So for example, I'm going to name that client and I'm going to open and close curly brackets. And then here with then here, I have the client object, which I can use now to do whatever. So for example, the client object is the same type of object as the socket. So I can also do send and then here send, for example, some message, for example, someone said this thing. Okay. Someone said this thing here. And this will be sent to everyone. So let's see if that works. Let's cross fingers. So node server.js. So now I have a very simple server is running. So let me open. So let me close all these connections and let me clear everything here. All right. So let me open a connection from my client on the right. So a client just connected and I'm and then the other one on the left, I'm also going to connect it. So the both clients are connected here. So with this one, I'm going to say hello from the right client. I'm going to send this and you can see that this client sent this and it this was what was received from the server, but that was also received on the other client. So now here I can say hello from the left client. And if I send this, you can see that the echo gets sent to both clients that are connected to the server right now, the left and the right. So if I say blah, 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 
and I send this to the server, that gets broadcasted, is the technical word, to every, um, to every client that is connected to the server. Ta -da! <laughs> How cool is this, right? So with barely, I mean, if we compress this, it's barely 10 lines of code, really. With 10 lines of code, we have been able to create a very simple WebSocket server that accepts incoming connections uh, from clients and whatever message it receives from them, it broadcasts that same message to everyone that is connected to that WebSocket. This is literally the core, the basics of any real-time chat function or any real-time chat window that you can find in a browser. Okay, awesome. So I think we're good for a simple WebSocket server. So what I'm going to do now in the next videos on this playlist is that I'm going to show you how to write a simple WebSocket client like this one from scratch. I'm going to also show you how to put this server somewhere on the cloud, so somewhere on the internet, so that it's not living on my machine, but it's living on the internet, and then we can all access this functionality uh, online. And then uh, finally, we're, I'm going to change to, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to teach you in the next videos also how to connect clients from other different platforms, such as Python, such as Grasshopper processing, etc., etc. So stay tuned for the um, for the playlist. And as usual, if you like this video, feel free to like it. Feel free to subscribe and to feel free to stay tuned with all the work that we do here in Parametric Camp. But we're not done. Let's keep doing more awesome WebSocket stuff. All righty. Oh, oh, and I have to go. Mm -hmm. I have a meeting, so I have five minutes to do some social. So, any questions, concerns? How was this? Huh? <laughs> How cool was this? Give me some thumbs up, or give me, you can give me a thumbs down if you didn't like it. Uh, that's also fine. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me close up a few windows here. Um, and if you have any questions, think, things you want to talk about. Otherwise, I'll see you back at 2 p.m. Boston time, and I will continue. So now we will write, um, I think this afternoon, what I would like to do is I would like to put this somewhere on the cloud. So I would like to write a client for, with JavaScript, so also with Node.js. I would like to teach you how to put this in the cloud. So I'm going to teach you how to use glitch.me, which is a really nice service for this kind of stuff. And then if we have time, then we will start doing more fancy stuff like um, drawing some geometry and having used this system to coordinate the location of that geometry uh, across different clients, which obviously is really, really cr freaking cool. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Looks like people are happy. Okay. So if there are no questions, then I'm going to take a small human break. Oh, all right. Can we run? Grasshopper components non sequential, you're like running two C sharp components at the same time instead of waiting for one to finish calculating and the other to start. Um, I am not sure because unfortunately, no matter how long I've been using Grasshopper, I still don't fully understand the life cycle of the solution space in Grasshopper. Um, so and that's not Grasshopper's fault. I think it's me. I just haven't spent enough time digging through the SDK and, and all the functions that are embedded. So I my initial response is to say no, just because conceptually, unless you're using threading and different CPUs and different processes, by principle, code is um, sequential and it's imperative. You can't run several processes at the same time unless they're threaded. Now, if what you want is to simulate that process by saying, well, I want to target these two components and I want to make sure that they both execute without waiting for the other, so, and then I halt the execution of Grasshopper until these two are done, and then I continue. 
that's the part where I think there are ways of doing that, but that um, escapes my, my knowledge of how to do that in an optimal way. So you know who would be a great person to ask for? Uh, Andrew Human. I think he would really, um, he would really know how to dig that down. Um, all right. So with that, I think I'm going to take a break. Uh, I have a meeting. So I'll see you back at 2, 2 p.m. Boston time. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being there. I hope this was fun. It's going to get even it's going to get way better as soon as we start connecting things together and make geometry move around. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you in a bit.